Hey there, everybody. Welcome once again, coming back each and every week to Leading Our Own Way. I have another amazing guest. I say it every week, but each guest brings a unique touch to the podcast, a unique journey in a unique way of navigating themselves out of whatever it is they're telling us a story about. Well, last week I had the pleasure of interviewing a lady called Sherelle Salulu. Um, this week it's her husband, LJ Salulu. She told me about his journey but very briefly in our pre-chat before we filmed her interview and I just knew straight away I had to get him on. Um, his transformation from the person he was, the way he was brought up with his Samoan background, this warrior mentality uh, brought over to Australia from New Zealand with that background, that warrior fighter mentality. Oh my God, you will look at him and listen to him in his soft beautiful character <laughs> come at a cost though right he had to work goddamn hard um and navigate himself through some some stuff man that <sighs> something he didn't want to repeat as a dad himself anyway we have a great chat um and i learned a lot from lj even for myself to be how I can be towards my own children. And I thought heavily about how I'm more present, but I still got work to do. He's incredible. I listened to his conversation. We have a really long chat and it's, um, it's good. It's really good. We'll be right back with LJ. Welcome to Leading Our Own Way. I'm your host, Andrew White, and this is the podcast that unveils captivating narratives of resilience and personal triumph. This podcast is for anyone seeking inspiration and insights on overcoming life's challenges. Follow and subscribe, and then we can lead together forever. Good evening, LJ. Welcome to Leading Our Own Way. How are you, brother? Good, thanks. How are you, Andy? I'm good. I'm good. Um... LJ, you are the husband of Sorelle Salulu and uh, had a bit of a trip up last week, but we interviewed your lovely wife. Um, it was an amazing episode and we were making a bit of a family affair. And um, she, she, in the episode, she told me a little bit about you and I thought, we've got to get this going. We, I had to interview you as well. So um, learning, leading our own way is becoming a bit of a family affair. Uh, so welcome. Yes. Uh, thank you for joining me on my journey, mate. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. I'm uh, hopefully it was all good things on the episode. <laughs> ah, it will be. We we had a really really good chat last time, uh, LJ. And um, you, are, as I was saying before we started the conversation, you are a guest on my pre-chat that I've been dying to know more from. But you worked really really hard not to give me too much information. Yet I have so many notes to look through as I record this episode. <laughs> <laughs> um. Tell us a little bit about yourself, LJ, uh, what you're doing and how you're leading your own way at the moment, mate. Uh, so at the moment, I'm mentoring teenagers. So prior to that, I was coaching fathers, helping fathers sort of get their lives back on track. And uh, we can go a bit deeper on that later. But sure. right now I'm following, I guess, my heart, what feels right. And uh, I still got one foot in the door with construction. Obviously, I have a family, so as a man, yeah. I, I still want to make sure I'm providing. Uh, but my heart is set on helping teenage boys, I guess helping my former self, my younger self, step into manhood with that guidance that I was missing. So, and I guess when it comes to leading my own way, it's I have to lead by example for myself in order to lead these young fellas to show, hey, this is what I'm doing, this is what's working. And, you know, I would like you to also embrace what I'm doing to help you overcome what you're going through in your life, because it would have helped me tremendously. Yeah. So, and and the T-shirt, is this this is what you're currently involved with, isn't it? What you're wearing, if everyone can see it on Spotify and YouTube, LJ's wearing a bit of a, a, a T-shirt. Talk to us a little bit about that then. The Teen Mentor? Yeah. The, uh, the, what yeah. Do, so what does so, YLP stand for? So that's Your Legacy Project. 
So, um, yes. I'm holding the legacy up a legacy project. Yeah. Sorry. It's, I guess, been my journey. It's uh, when I decided that I needed to change because the life I was living was very toxic and it just wasn't a life I wanted to bring a family into. I decided that, you know, one day I'm going to have children, I'm going to have a wife, and the legacy I want to leave behind is something I can be proud of, a person they can be proud of, a husband that, you know, is worthy of the wife to live this life that I was trying to strive for. So it, it's been a project probably the last 15 years of creating myself into that legacy that I can leave behind that I can be happy with. So yeah, that's where your legacy yeah. project comes from. And the team mentoring is just uh, where I want to mentor those teenage boys to, to help them find themselves and just help them become confident in, in their own skin and help them pave a pathway that leads to a manhood that they can be proud of. Yeah, nice. With the with the with the the um, the, the teenagers that come through your door, um, if I was to attend the um, the places that you do the mentoring and things like that, what would be if I was sat in? The, I mean, paint that picture. Do you sit in a circle with these guys? Do you go out on events with them? If I was there with you uh, when you're mentoring these teens, what would that look like? At the moment, the face-to-face -face stuff is weekly catch-ups, and uh, we start off with some just some physical activity, just moving the body, and it's more to uh, get them up and moving and energetic, and to break that ice. You know, like if you remember when you were a teenage boy, if you're anything like me, it's I don't want to be here. <laughs> Why has mum or dad brought me here? So it's it's a nice easy way to get them interacting, get them moving. Um, and then we just start breaking down into uh, just real talk, conversations about, you know, I like to share a lot about my life story, what I've been through, and just to help relate to where they are. And it's it's not about me saying, hey, you've got to do this. It's like, this is where I've been, and if this is how you feel, then let's talk about it. And I found that myself sharing my stories and allowing myself to be vulnerable in front of the boys that they find it's a safe space for them to sort of speak. And, um, I, yeah, it, it's nice to see them take on what I'm offering to them. So, yeah. yeah. And what type of stories and journeys uh, do some of the boys hold? Obviously you, you, you can't mention, we don't want you to mention names yeah. or anything like that. But what was some? What would be some of the stories that come through? If you could just um, explain, maybe one or two of those. Oh, a lot of the boys I work with come from broken families. You know, they they don't have a father that's either present or wants to be present, um, or they come from families where the the relationships between mum and dad are very strained. So they're they feel like they're not being seen. They're avoiding just anything and everything. They're drawing back into themselves. Um, so by working with these boys, I'm allowing them to voice or to even start to understand what they're feeling and what they're going through and to give them that awareness of like, okay, that is what I'm feeling. I can name it now. And that's because of this and it's okay. And I guess in, in a, I'm almost giving them like a big brother, you know what I mean? Like just someone that just said, listen, not to judge, just to give them advice of what I have done or what I've, what I've experienced or what I wish I had done. Um, but yeah. I bet, it, I bet it's been beautiful to see your connection with these boys that seeing that 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 stereo blockage being present and they seem push off and has it been quite nice to see those blockages fall down and that connection form yeah, and developed into definitely. hope you know that definitely. feeling seen value and heard leading to hope and then crossing the bridge of connection how how beautiful has that been for you as well it's um 
yeah, it just it lights me up. It it makes me feel, you know, those warm fuzzy feelings. Um, we had one young fella whose mum had to walk him to the front door, and then he, you know, she sort of just said, "Oh, he's he's shy, he's anxious, and this stuff." And I said, "That's cool." I was like, "Look, if you don't want to talk, you don't have to talk. Just sit there and just be present." Um, he hid himself in his hoodie. So if you think of Kenny in South Park, he was, you could only just see his eyes. And uh, by, you know, three, four weeks in, you know, his hoodie was off, he was smiling, walking in, have a bit of a joke with the boys, sit down, and you, you could see that he was um, just in such a better headspace. You, it, uh, it was a totally different boy. He was contributing in the class. He's making jokes and and just to see that and to know that I helped him just by having normal conversations and listening and it's just an amazing feeling. It's it's hard to explain. So yeah. Yeah. No, it's beautiful. It's amazing that you're creating these safe spaces for these boys to who don't feel heard and safe and valued and seen to to feel all of the all, all those things isn't it it's an it's an it's an amazing it that you know that's compassion isn't it you're putting yourself in a physical position to help these boys uh that clearly need it um the and they probably don't get what they need not only at, at at home, but at school maybe as well. You know, the teachers are just teaching them and don't, unfortunately, in a difficult time for themselves, they don't have that time available to give them what you're able to give them. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, that's right. How long do these boys tend to um, stay with you? Do they, is it, do they, do they just keep coming? Is there a time frame? How does that look? Yeah, I've been playing around with six to eight week programs. Um, yeah. And at the moment, I've, I'm working on an online program because I get a lot of interest from uh, different states. Amazing. And, uh, yeah. So I, I find my, my programs lately have been the eight-week programs, and they've been good. Uh, it, sometimes it can be a bit hard holding the boys' attention for that long. Yeah. Um, but no, they, they've all gone well. It's, yeah. I, I still keep regular contact with most of the boys. Uh, they'll message me from their mum's phone or whatnot and just be like, hey, coach, uh, did this today. And I'll be like, hey, awesome, bud, keep it up. So, Amazing. yeah, it's always, always nice to receive those messages. And have you had um, anyone complete the program but maybe needs to stay on longer or uh, flourished into the world and go, not that they don't need you anymore, but, you know, in a way can can fly away happily as, you know, what's happened there? Yeah, uh, it, it's 50 50. It's, um, and it's also depending on the age, but by, by the time they've finished the eight weeks with myself, they feel very confident to take that next step because in that eight weeks, we're focusing on the future. And almost all of the boys that I've worked with have told me that they've never thought about the next three years, five years, what that could look like for them. They're just told school will be finished soon, then you've got to get a job. And for them, it's like, okay, well, I've got plenty of time. I'll just find a job when I'm finished. So to be able to plan out that future and that man, what type of man they want to become with creating those values and how they want to be seen, um, a lot of the boys go away feeling pretty confident to start tackling it themselves. I do have, you know, the other half of the boys where they still want to keep regular contact. And I think that's where I'm trying to, you know, I'm in the process of creating that online program where they, we can have access to each other and I can feed them the, I guess, the um, lessons and modules that they'll need on a daily, weekly basis. And they can, I can introduce them to men of influence uh, just yeah. to keep helping them on their journey. If I, I, I'm, as you know, I'm in education and I do talk about my podcast, uh, particular to the schools, some of the uh, schools that are, are in the rougher areas. Um, I can see the lack of connection that they, some boys and girls, uh, but in, because we're talking about boys, boys in particular don't have connection at home. If I was to tell them about you, 
and to watch this episode and to sp and, and to maybe make contact with you. I know we're in a different state. LJ is it for anyone who doesn't know. We, we'll, we will get into a little bit about your personal life in a second. Uh, but LJ is in Perth on the other side of Australia. Um, if the, some of those boys at these schools that I go to were to make contact with you uh, and they were curious about what you would go through on some of the programs, apart from you telling your story, because obviously we're going to dive e into this episode about your story, because that's really what it's about. What would some of the um, goals, values or modules look like if you were going to say that to the one of the boys now that were approaching you? Well, I'd like to find out a bit about themselves first. Um, to have that bit of background story of what they've been through or what they're happy to share with me. Yeah. Helps you know the baseline of where they sort of need to go. And of then course. from there, it, it's more finding out, okay, this is where you've been, but where do you want to go? Who do you want to become? You know, what does he look like? And for me, it's it's creating that visceral feeling for them where they've never ever thought that deep before. And uh, and it's like, if you could imagine yourself in ten years' time, what sort of life would you be living? How would you be dressing? How would people look at you? How would you be talking to people? And once we can paint a clear enough picture where they can see themselves in the next five, 10 years time. And it's like, okay, now that you've painted that picture with me, let's start creating a path to get there. It's, it's like, is he confident? Okay. How are we going to build up that confidence? Is he leading teams? Okay. So how does he communicate with his teams? How do you want to be communicated to? Um, and it, it's, it's just identifying the man or the person he wants to step into and it's 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 creating it's creating a a real clear vision of everything that encompasses this man they want to become so it's it's a journey but it's it's also a to be able to give someone that clarity whether they're a young boy or a grown man it's the keys to recreating who they want to become. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like so many times people want to say, I want to change. I want to do this, but they never actually change because it becomes too hard. And what I find is that if you focus on too much, then you're going to get overwhelmed. So when I'm working with these boys, it's like, what's most important to you right now? What do you want to change? Is it your health? Is it your fitness? Is it your mentality? And it's like, okay, you want to work on your mentality? Then let's do that. Let's focus on that one thing and get so strong at that that you're going to be not second-guessing your mental toughness. Then it'll be like, okay, your mental toughness is strong. What do you want to work on next? And it's like, okay, you want to work on your body? You want to work on your physical health? Let's go there. Because if we do too much at once, it's, it's never going to happen. We're going to get too overwhelmed. We're going to fall back into old habits. We're going to fall back into what's comfortable. So... For each boy, it's a different journey. I know how to get them there, but you've got to work with them because I can't say, hey, this is it. I want you to do all this because they're not going to do it. Men yeah. themselves struggle to do that because men, we don't like to be told what to do. We have to be <laughs> almost, we also have to be like taken to the answer. You know, it's like, yeah, you came up with that yourself. So I did. I did come up with that yeah. myself. So I'll do that. I was like, cool. Are you committing to that? Yeah. Are you committing to three training sessions a week? Are you committing to a cold shower every day? And they're like, I think I will. I'm like, cool. Good for you, buddy. I'm excited. Yeah. Uh, we get along because of the cold shower stuff just alone, mate, to be fair. We, we had a good <laughs> chat about that last time, didn't we? Yeah. Um, the viewers already kind of know a little bit about your family life. Obviously, we've heard Terrell's um, uh, side of it, but everybody already knows you're expecting your third baby. Third one's on the way yes. in a matter of weeks. How is everything? Yes. Congratulations, by the way. But how's that all Thank going? It's, um, it's a lot of things. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> exciting. It's, it's hectic because we've got two younger ones. Yeah. Um, but we, we, we're truly blessed. Um, the journey of parenting or becoming the family we are, it's, it's has had its ups and downs, you know, on, and when you've had some pretty big miscarriages and gone through those things and you don't really understand just how that really impacts you. Like growing up, you hear those stories and you can't really 
it's not until it happens to you that you can relate and you've gone through it. But uh, I'm very blessed to have um, my son, my, my oldest, and my, my daughter is with us now. They are yin and yang, <laughs> but they bring so much, just so much joy into our life. Um, Sherelle's a great mother. She's, you know, ever since we, uh, we just celebrated our 10 years together yesterday. And, I saw um, I congratulated you guys online. I saw that. Amazing. Mm, yes. And just our time together has been a journey. The transformation of myself and, and herself. It's um, who we were 10 years ago to who we are today. It's, it's just a, a big transformation. And couldn't have done that without Sherelle. That support. It's um, when you find someone that supports you and loves you that much, it's, it's, it's almost like, how can you not? achieve you know your best version in anything in life so I'm, I'm very blessed to have the wife i have and the children i have so yeah yeah amazing yeah you've the got a beautiful family. child is coming into our life they're they're very yeah. lucky <laughs> how, how many weeks do you have now until the third one arrives four weeks today but the way sherelle's tummy's dropping it could be in two weeks three weeks we just don't know so yeah wow you, you, I remember Sherelle talking about in her episode about she spoke very well about how you when you went through that unfortunate time of the miscarriage of how you held space for her and just held her. You 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 know you didn't talk. You just just held her and and she just said you handled it beautifully. Um, and 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 she explained how difficult much of a time that was. And and I obviously send my heart foam, you know hugs to you guys. That's but you guys have got a beautiful family and um she's your transformation is obviously you held quite a lot of information back so my reactions can be quite authentic today and probably this is a good time to maybe go back to your childhood uh, and of where your journey began um your mentality of why you've created um your legacy project where did that mentality come to open that? And I feel like we're going to connect the dots here a little bit. Um, yeah, where did your mentality start for that? So why did I decide to change? Yeah, I so feel like own, it connects your to, your, to your childhood, doesn't it? Definitely. I think we all look back on, you know, where a lot of our uh, demons come from. It's generally from our childhood. Yeah. Um, yeah, I had a... I had a rough childhood. It was for me. It was, I, it was. I didn't know any better either. So it was a hard upbringing, and you know, a, a strict father. Very lucky. Um, I had a very loving mother that counteracted my father's strictness. And um, growing up with men around you that were very physically masculine so they prided themselves on on strength on uh i guess like the warrior mentality um, i've got a polynesian background i'm samoan so we grew up on stories of our ancestors being headhunters and warriors and being the ones chosen to go out to fight the um you know arriving tribes you know, they would send one warrior from each tribe and whoever would come back would be the victor. And, you know, we, we sort of pride ourselves on our family being the ones that was always selected. And, you know, our, our, um, our ancestors, our, our, the, the men would always come back victors, you know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. How, how true those stories are, we never know. But when you grow up and you hear those stories and it's like, okay, and it's painting a picture of like, okay, this is part of our identity. This is who I'll become. And when you grow up like that and live in a Western society and live in a world that doesn't embrace that warrior mentality, you get pretty lost. So, yeah, I think growing up with that mentality, it takes you so far. And, and for me, it just got to a point where it's like, 
something needs to change. This isn't working. I don't want to do this for another 50 years. Yeah, because your family moved from New Zealand uh, when you were two years old to Perth, is that correct? Yeah, I was pretty young. So coming from New Zealand um, for the rest of the world, New Zealand looks pretty close to Australia, but the culture in New Zealand um, is very still very different, isn't it? Um, did that have an effect yeah. in being in Australia and bringing that, that culture to Perth as well? Yeah, it did. Like my, my parents um, are Samoan, so they're both Samoan, so they migrated to New Zealand with their um, parents. Uh, so that's where a lot of our stories come from. Um, of course, yeah. In, in New Zealand, that's... yeah, in, in New Zealand, they still grew up in the rough parts of New Zealand, in Auckland, Otara. And back in those days, comes with their own stories you know my, my father and my uncles they were part of gangs there like everyone had to be part of gangs back then to protect the town from rival gangs that were coming in to cause havoc and everything else that was happening back in those days in the 70s and stuff like that so you know I grew up with those stories too of just how badass uncles were and father was and there's some pretty hectic stories, you know, and so for me, it's, it's it's just reconfirming, like, okay, all right, this is what I got to do. This is the level I can take it if I need to. This is what is acceptable and I'll be okay. So, yeah. What kind of stories were you told as a child then of, of your father's childhood or young adulthood? Um, so my father... Uh, he was a karate champion, Budokan karate champion for New Zealand. So he traveled a lot for that stuff. So he was, he was physically strong sort of force to be reckoned with. Um, but he was also, you know, with my mum's brother and, you know, other family members, part of, um, a gang in Auckland as well that they, you know, what I'm told is they were more or less helping protect the people of the town because another bikey gang would come into town and just, you know, just ruin things, you know, like really, they, they painted a pretty bad picture. But my father, um, there's, there's one story that I remember hearing where something happened to my grandmother. I can't remember what it was. My, my dad took to grabbing a weapon and chasing after that person. And it sort of wasn't until he sort of got up to him. And I think my mom was yelling in the background that she was able to get through to him just in time before it escalated and something happened. And, you know, yeah. and when you're hearing those sort of stories and it's being said quite casually and it's, and it's laughed about, you don't really think any, you get desensitized to, to violence, you know, it's just, it's, um, yeah, so those are the types of stories I grew up with, you know, the gang fights and stuff like that. And, you know, I, my uncle was a very hard, respected man. Um, and my, my father and them were, were very close and they, they did these things together. But it was always, from their point of story, the point of view was they were always protecting someone or others to, I guess, justify those actions yeah so moving to perth from uh, from new zealand did they do that for a better life uh, to change the trajectory of his family and, and you guys even though they still kind of brought that mentality to bringing you guys up um what was the reason coming to australia then with you guys yeah 100 percent, 100 percent. it was um it was just to train change that trajectory it was to new beginnings my father wanted to create um, just a better environment for us kids growing up. He wanted to, uh, you know, get into the construction game, the mining. He wanted to provide a house and a safe home. And so that was his priority. And moving away is what he had to do to make that happen. 
was he successful in doing that? Yeah, he, he was. He was. He, uh, obviously, that changing that mentality was very, you know, you can't just change that overnight. So he still has that warrior mentality, but his behavior and actions wasn't brought over with him. He was able to leave the gang stuff over in New Zealand, and it was just his focus on family. My dad's massive on family. Um, so it's it's just making sure that he's providing, he's protecting, and he was bringing us in, bringing us up in the image that he thought would be beneficial for us. And also the only way he knew, like he had a hard life. So bringing us up hard was what he thought was necessary. So bringing that mentality even though he he'd left that sort of life, but still having that warrior mentality in Perth with young children, um, you said it was normalized with having these stories that you know, uh, yeah, having these stories brought to you. Um, how did that um, put you on a path then in your like going to school, high school? Um, what you did in your social? Did you go off the tracks? Did you did did you did you follow the vision that you're dad and mum had set out for you guys yeah yeah it's uh i followed the warrior mentality path more so because i wanted to be seen um if i think back on my childhood i was quite an introverted kid i like to be i like to keep to myself when my father got me into rugby when i was about six seven years old and I just wasn't that, um, I wasn't a physical kid. Like, I didn't want to hurt anyone. Um, playing rugby, I guess, was my father's way of, um, yeah, I don't know. He, he enjoyed rugby playing, uh, playing rugby when he was younger. So, obviously, having that Polynesian background, it's like, you're going to play rugby. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't know if he was trying to live past dreams through myself. But um, to begin with, I really didn't want a bar of it. You know what I mean? I just, I didn't want to hurt other people. I didn't want to tackle other people. I just wanted to play with my toys and be left alone, but I wasn't. And I just remember one game where uh, I just had enough. You know, I had enough of being yelled at from my dad. You know, he'd always be on the sideline, so I tried to go to the other side of the field where he'd be going off at me to either tackle more, run more, or get up in the defence line more. Then I'd go to the other side of the field and he'd make his way over there. And I just remember scrumming, being in a scrum, and I think I was about eight years old, and I had enough. And there was another kid on the other side of the team that was just giving me lip. And I, I just remember pulling back a bit and then uppercutting him. And I gave him a blood nose. And I sort of stepped back and I was like, oh, uh oh, I'm in trouble. And <laughs> I don't know if it was just that time back then, but... I was praised a lot for that. You know, I don't think many of the parents liked that other kid because of his attitude or how he was. But, you know, I got lots of claps on the backs from other parents going, you did a good job. My father was real happy with me. And I was, just remember thinking, well, if this is what I've got to do to, to be seen, to not get in trouble. And then I was like, maybe I'm onto something. So, you know, from that age, I started to figure out, okay, there's things I can do to be seen and to get that attention and not get in trouble. So I started to sort of play around with, um, you know, how hard I could tackle, how hard I could run, uh, just more or less being a menace and Year after year, I would step it up and step it up that little bit more just to be seen. Um, and I think everything just that if there was a turning point where I left that little boy behind that just wanted to be left alone and wanted to play and be a kid, it was it would have to be around that moment. Yeah. What what made you feel that you weren't seen to begin with? Join us tomorrow to hear more from today's incredible guests and learn valuable insights to help you lead your own way. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you then.